So, uh, this is flushing crappy API libs. Uh, that's a bad poo joke. Thank you, Bennett, for helping me make that joke. Um, um, so, uh, that's me. Uh, I'm Tim Nugent, if you don't know me, hello. Uh, I'm from UTAS. Uh, there's about 10 jillion of us here. Um, that's our official hashtag, you should always use that. I, I must admit, I don't actually know how long this talk is going to take, uh, because last night, instead of um, practicing, my friends thought it would be funny to take advantage of my good nature and ply me full of alcohol, and then convince this lady that I was a psychic, um, is what they thought would, would be better than me practicing my slides. So, not really sure how long this will take. Might be really quick, might take forever. We'll find out together, it'll be an adventure. Um, so, what is this talk actually about? Um, it's pretty much just some tricks I've learnt for dealing with APIs. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm trying to impart my glorious knowledge to all you poor peons. Um, it's tricks and libraries I've used that have kept me sane. Um, very sane, because there's so many bad APIs out there. Uh, so, what isn't this talk? Uh, it's not how to design an API. Um, I actually don't know how to do this. I have no idea how you design a good API. Uh, I just have to deal with lots of bad ones. Um, it's not how to deal with a specific crappy API. There's way too many out there to focus on a specific one. Uh, and I don't think it'd be very interesting to sort of go through how the Twitter API is bad. Uh, I think that would be really boring. Um, it's not how to deal with your crappy API. You're on your own. Um, if you wrote your own API and it sucks, tough. If you're using someone else's API and it sucks, also tough. Um, I can't help with that. You're just going to have to hopefully gain enough knowledge from this that uh, you can do it. And I hope that does actually help. Um, so, APIs. Uh, what are they? Um, in a nutshell, they're comprised of two things. Data, which you interact with and send across, and network, which is how you send and receive the data. Um, that's all they really have uh, from your perspective as the developer. Ideally, you should have a nice, clean, smooth interface. Everything should be obvious. There's a nice sphere. It's got two arms. It's very clear what's going to happen here. Everything's nice and simple. However, what you end up with is this. Uh, it's lumpy. It's covered in dirt. There's leaves popping out of it. Uh, it's got weird things. You'll end up downloading huge amounts of data. You'll end up people doing weird things with their data. Could be, you know, ugh. You don't know what you're going to end up with, but you're the poor sucker who has to deal with this horrible mess and, and make it the nice smooth sphere for the user's perspective anyway. So uh, I want to first talk about data. Um, the, the two popular kids on the block are XML and JSON. Um, occasionally, you'll also still see CSV or TSV for tabs or arbitrary separator V. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually focus on XML first. Uh, because XML is probably the bigger of all three, I would say. Um, the main advantage of XML is it's got this nice tree-like structure. An XML document, assuming it's not just like an Excel spreadsheet uh, that's been exported, uh, should have a nice tree structure. There'll be some sort of root object and then sub-objects below it which uh, change how it works, change the data. Problem is almost no one does it like that. Uh, people just throw everything in. They think just putting chevrons around stuff suddenly make it great XML. It just makes it hard to parse. Um, but uh, there's, there's two main ways of dealing with XML. There's SACS, which is simple uh, API for XML, and uh, DOM, which is document object model. So having a look at SACS um, first. SACS is kind of interesting, uh, and it's very popular on mobile devices. Uh, it, it's basically you're dragging some sort of parser through the tree as you go along, and every time you run into something, so every time the baby hits something, you get told about it, and then you deal with it. Um, it it's really, really fast, stupidly fast. Um, really, really, really low memory, uh, and that's why Apple wants you to use it. Uh, the biggest problem is it's a real pain in the ass to use. Uh, so Apple want you to use this NSXML parser thing, you know, that's not too bad, you know, you're in it with some sort of data, you set a delegate, and then you run into these did start element namespace URI qualified name attributes, did end element, my uh, mic is not very sticky, um, I'll just hold it. Um, so what, what you've got then is this did end element namespace URI qualified name attributes, etc, 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 
And every time you run into an element, your delegate gets told. And it's up to you to then create the data out of it, deal with it, store that somewhere. So you're basically, in my opinion, throwing away the good thing of XML, which is this lovely tree. Um, it is really fast, though, and it is really low memory. So it is sometimes uh, useful. Um, so if we go back, the other option is DOM, uh, which is the document object model. And that is pretty much, in a nutshell, just loading the whole thing into your memory, storing it in your vault. Um, the problem with this is, because you're loading everything into memory, it's really memory inefficient. That's the, uh, the trade-off. But it does let you access any part of the tree at any time you want, uh, which, to be honest, is probably what you're going to want to do most of the time. Yeah. Someone's sending me eye messages. Um, so I want to talk about Rapture XML, which is a third-party library. Um, it's actually amazing. I actually prefer XML now than JSON in the past because of how good Rapture XML is. Rapture XML is actually amazing. So um, if you've got some sort of data like this, uh, it's, it's a collection of characters. Um, to ah, Mike, good job with the mic, Tony. Um, so uh, to grab this, you pretty much just create a RXML element. Uh, you grab the element from the file. Uh, in this case, I've just called it adventuretime.xml. Obviously, you have to grab that normally. Um, if you want, you could just actually print out the tag. There's a property on every XML element, which is the tag itself. And then suddenly, you'd be told show. Um, you can grab attributes of it, such as the name of the show in this case, and that would respond with adventure time. Uh, you can just grab, as a child, any element from it. You can just go, I want the child that is called characters. And that will just return it. It will return nil if you have put in a invalid um, identifier. And then from there you can actually uh, grab an array of all of the children inside there and they will also all be RXML nodes inside that. Uh, which is also quite nice and then from that you could go, you know, I want the object at index and I want his name and I want that converted into text and that'll spit out fin human in this case for us. Um, so by itself, in my opinion, this already makes Rapture XML better than anything else you'll ever do with XML, just because of how simple it is to get and work your way through the tree. Uh, it actually gets better. Um, Rapture XML is like block mad. Uh, I'm also block mad, so this meshes very well with, with how I think things should be done. Rapture XML has this thing which they've called block-based queries through iteration. And basically, you grab your root node and you go, uh, I want to iterate over everything which matches characters and then inside characters I want to match every villain and I want it to use this block to do it and that will spit out inside that block that character is an individual node of that child so in this case if you run it you'd get Magic Man and Hunts and Abadir because they're the villains um, but say for example you, you want to be a little bit less specific and you just want to know all of the ages of every character so you don't care whether they're heroes or not you can actually use wildcards inside the query strings as well. Um, so you can go like characters, star, age, and then that will return all the ages of every single character inside the XML. So in this case, 200, immortal, 15, etc, etc, etc. And if you really want, you can use iterate with XPath and pass in an XPath string if you know what that is. If you don't use their query strings, it's better anyway. Um, so that's XML. Uh, the next one would be JSON. Um, I actually like NSJSON serialization. I have no real problem with it. Um, some people have told me they prefer SPJSON, um, but I, I've never had any issues with NSJSON serializer, so I think if you just read the Apple Docs, you should be set with that. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so then finally would be CSV. Uh, so CSV is a little weird. Um, it, it's you, you, You're wrapping your variables inside a line and then they're separated by a comma or some sort of separator value, generally a comma, sometimes a tab, occasionally you'll see semicolons or colons used. Um, and it's not hard to write your own parser, but why would you when there's plenty out there already? Uh, one I've used in the past is called CHCSV parser. Um, so imagine your data is separated like that. Uh, so it's pretty similar to what the XML was, but now it's a CSV. Um, to go through that, you, they actually add a category to NSArray, so you can just go array with contents of CSV file, pass in a file path, 
and then that returns an array of, well, arrays of arrays inside of which are text. So you can grab every individual <coughs> element out of it uh, if you wanted. So in this case, we're grabbing out the age of everyone inside that CSV. Um, as an added bonus, there's different options for how you want to parse it inside this. So you can make it an arbitrary separator if you want. So if you've for some reason got a ampersand separated value file, uh, you could just pass in the ampersand as one of the options while you're parsing it. Um, it. It does have this thing called chcsv parser delegate, uh, which works basically the same as to how nsxml parser delegate works. But then you're back to dragging the baby through the forest. Um, so I don't see any point in that. I don't think it really adds any advantage. Um, speaking really quickly, so I'll slow down a little bit. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is networking, which is probably more important to actually get right, in my opinion, um, because it doesn't matter how good or bad the data is, if you can't talk to it, you can't actually do anything with it. Um, so networking, if anyone can figure out what this means, my, my links are very tenuous. If you work it out, tell me. No one's going to work it out, will they? <coughs> Excellent. I win. Um, <laughs> trust me, there's a link. It, it's the first time she met Finn, so she's networking. Oh, did you? Oh, sorry, Andrew. I, I, I missed that. Um, okay, so the way Apple wants you to do it is it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you, you create an NSURL for the request. You create an NSURL for the NSURL request. You create an NSURL connection with the NSURL request with the NSURL for the request. You then implement connection did receive response. That's, it's okay. You then implement connection did finish loading. That, that actually seems okay. Uh, you then deal with redirects via connection will send request response direct. You then implement connection did write data total bytes written expected total bytes. And then finally you need to also have connection did finish downloading data destination URL. So I mean you only need to do seven stupidly huge steps and you need to do all of them because uh, some of them you can skip, but then if something goes wrong, you haven't got any way of handling it. Uh, so I mean, the Apple way will only take you half an hour to write. Um, I know because I had to figure out how to do it again because I'd forgotten, so I did it last night. Um, or, or the option is to use AF networking. Um, AF networking is quite interesting. It was originally created as part of GoWalla. Did anyone actually know what GoWalla is out of interest? Oh, awesome. A few people. It was like a Foursquare competitor that got crushed and disappeared. Did it really? Oh, okay. Got bought out by Facebook. Um, and AF networking uh, was spun out of that. It's like the last remnant of Goala. It just got updated. Um, so some of the things I'm not fully sure of as to how they work yet. Some of the bits I'm still trying to figure out myself. Uh, but what is so amazing about AF networking? Uh, it's blocks, again. Um, AF networking is block mad. Again, I'm block mad. So we mesh really well. Um, or I like to think we do. If, if AF networking was a person, I, I think we'd be best friends. Um, I'm going to pretend we were. Um, so the way you, you would do a GET request, is that actually readable? There's a lot of light on it, unfortunately. Um, so this here is actually doing all of the 10 jillion steps that Apple wanted to do. Uh, and basically, there's just two blocks passed in, a success block, which will pass in the actual response, and a failure block, which will pass in an error. And it's all in line. It's all where your data is. It requires no setup whatsoever. You don't even need to make a crappy NSURL and wrap that inside an NSURL request, then connect that through an NSURL connection with an NSURL request with an NSURL in it. You just put in a string of the URL, and then it's good to go. Um, and it actually works amazingly well. Uh, from my understanding, it is actually just a wrapper for the Apple way of doing it. But that's fine by me if they want to have to deal with that. If you want it to send data, um, it's, it's got this uh, parameters section, which is where you can actually add extra data. So in the case here, we're pushing data to uh, mysuperurl.com slash setage. And again, it's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, to do this with the Apple way, you're going to have to have all these huge ifs inside all the different delegate methods to make sure that you're sending the correct data to the correct place, the NSURL request, your NSURL, which goes inside your NSURL connection. <sighs> Um, I swear they're trying to just make you say NSURL. I think they get paid maybe a, a certain amount every time they make you say it. Um, or write it, perhaps. S same with, like, checkpoints. It's like, I swear Xcode engineers get paid a dollar every time you enable a checkpoint in Xcode. It pops up so damn often. Um, so this is the sort of the standard way of doing AF networking. It's got a whole bunch of other stuff in it, which I haven't really touched. And it got updated very, very recently. 
um, to AF Networking 2.0 uh, by recently, I think it was last month if I remember correctly. And uh, I have no idea what's new in that. I haven't really done a lot with it. Uh, this is partially some of the new stuff, but it's also partially some of the old stuff. But yeah, there's a bunch of new things in there, uh, which I don't fully understand myself because I've not actually done enough stuff in it to say. But AF networking is still far more amazing than using uh, NSURL connection. Um, so, I, I want to talk a bit about socket programming. Um, see, that, that one's an easy connection, yeah. Um, so, um, something I, I learned quite recently is you actually have no idea how damn good um, HTTP communication is until you have to deal with sockets directly. Uh, I actually had no idea how much HTTP actually sort of f covers all the crap that you have to deal with. Um, and you won't understand how good uh, the library I'm going to show you is until you understand how bad you have to do it the other way. Uh, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just briefly trying to show you how Apple wants you to do socket programming. Um, so does anyone remember NSStream? Uh, the thing that always pops up when you're typing NSString um, is, is how I remember it. Uh, that, that's pretty much as, that's what it is in my head. Um, so. There's two subclasses, NS input stream, which is for dealing for input, and NS output stream, which is for pushing data back out. Um, the thing is, they're actually useless. Uh, they can't talk to anything, really. Uh, so you also need their, their core foundation buddies to come along for the ride. So now you've got, a, so you've got an NS input stream, an NS output stream, a CF uh, read stream, and a CF write stream. Yeah, write stream. Sorry, write stream ref. Um, and they can actually do things. They can connect. The NS streams can't. They are just a nice wrapper for them. So then, I mean, it, you know, it's not too hard. You just you get connecting there. So you got this CS stream create pair with socket to host. I mean, that that's not too bad. Um, that that's how you actually connect to the host. Um, now you can actually start using your NS streams that you created. Uh, but first, of course, you have to toll free bridge them to their core foundation variants because I don't know why Apple decided that for some reason you can't just use them directly, whatever reason. Uh, now is when you can actually use them. Uh, so you've now got this uh, input stream open, output stream open, uh, and then this is when you can start sending and receiving data through it. Um, the great thing is now you have to deal with the delegate methods again because uh, Apple loves delegates. Uh, so, you know, this one isn't too bad. You sort of got stream handle event. Um, this is technically the only one you have to implement. Um, the great thing about this one though is that event parameter that gets passed in. I mean there's like six variants upon that uh, and you also don't know when you've been told something because unlike HTTP there's nothing to rearrange it for you into the nice neat order at the other end. You just get sent packets whenever the hell you get sent them and then you have to deal with what you sent. So you don't know whether it's, you'll know whether it's the input or the output stream but you don't know from which packet you sent. It's the input and output stream. You have to work that out yourself using these events. So, I mean, you've got, you know, NS stream event none. I have no idea what this does. I, does the delegate just occasionally get called with nothing? I'm not sure. Apparently, there's a none event. I mean, to go alongside that, there's completed, which is when it's finished or when it thinks it's finished talking. And then you've got has bytes available, has space available, some event error occurred, which is really great because it's very helpful as to telling you what's gone wrong. Uh, and then you've got event end occurred. Uh, how that's different from completed, I don't know. Um, oh, one's opening, one's closing. There you go. Uh, so I was doing an application recently, and it was all socket programming. Socket programming with XML, which seems really weird to me, because why, <laughs> why are you using a high-level data structure with a low-level networking idea? I don't know. Um, that was a lot of fun, and I spent about a week writing this this stream sort of connection library to try and talk to things, uh, and then I actually found GCD Socket Async. Um, it's an updated version of Coco uh, Socket Async. Uh, it's updated to support Grand Central Dispatch. It supports it by default. In fact, you have to support Grand Central Dispatch. If you don't, it won't work, um, but that's actually good. And for the amount of things that this abstracts away for you, it's actually pretty much magical um, for what you get. 
Uh, so you no longer need four different streams just to connect. You now actually have just three lines. Um, you create a socket queue. Uh, sorry, you create a dispatch queue. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have actually done dispatch queue stuff before. I'm assuming a few of you have. It's basically just a new queue to run Grand Central operations on. Uh, and it's a good idea to do that so you're not mucking up your main thread. Um, so I'm just creating a new dispatch queue for, uh, to do things on. And then there's my socket is the next line. Uh, I'm just allocating it and then initializing it with a delegate. Uh, and then I'm passing in the queue that it wants to operate on. Um, so by default, it's already running on a secondary queue, so it's not going to mess up with your main thread. Uh, and it's already done everything that the previous eight lines required. And then I just go connect to host, pass in the IP, pass in the port. Uh, you can add a timeout in, which is actually really cool. Um, if the timeout is a negative number, it will keep trying until either the app crashes or the user quits it or something else interrupts it. Um, if you don't have the timeout, if you do put a timeout, it will try and follow that. It's From my testing, it's not 100% guaranteed. It seems to be a little bit of fudge factor in there. I was playing around with sort of five second timeouts for some things and sometimes they time out after three and sometimes they time out after about eight. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I think that might just be something to do with how the library is actually chaining everything together. But the timeout is quite useful to have. Then when you actually want to read or write data, you just tell your socket that you want to read or write data. So in this case, I am sending two data packets and I'm reading one data packet back in. Um, the great thing about this is because it's all asynchronous, it handles everything. I have literally just sent it two packets of data uh, and then I've fired them out and then I might not even actually be connected yet. It might still be connecting. It will queue them up, wait until I'm connected and then send them out when it gets the chance. Same with the reading. Uh, so I'm trying to read a response when I haven't even sent the data yet. So it knows that, it'll wait, queue it up until it needs to and then read it when something actually starts coming in from the, the uh, socket. The other really, really nice thing uh, is this tag parameter on here. Um, the tag parameter is for you and it gets passed into every single method that you ever read with, um, which is basically an easy way of breaking down what you're currently doing. So before with uh, NSStream, you have to remember which packet you're currently doing. Uh, this way with the tag, it remembers the tag that you've sent in so you know, oh, okay, so I'm writing with tag one and now my read to data is reading with tag one. The other nice thing about this is the read data to data method. If you happen to know what the end character or the, the termination of a particular packet will look like, say it's an XML packet, you know it'll end in like slash packet, for example. You can actually pass that in uh, to this read data to data and when it finds that, it knows it's finished the packet, can close it, wrap it up and then send that off to you. So you don't even have to wait for it to actually properly terminate, it can figure out when to terminate based on what you've told it. Um, you can also, if you want, read data to a certain length if you know the packets are all going to be 5 kilobytes or some arbitrary size that you happen to know, you can read them to a certain position and then uh, wrap them up and send it off to you. Um, the only thing that kind of confused me was um, this bit here. Uh, so this is the delegate method. So after you ask it to read something, it doesn't actually read it because it's asynchronous, it just tells its magic system to wait until it's ready to read it, and then this delegate gets passed in. This is my only real complaint. I wish they did that with a block, because um, like I said, I'm block mad, um, and these guys clearly aren't. But basically, all this is doing here is when it's ready to read something, it passes in the data, and then it passes in the tag that was used to uh, create and read that data, and then from there, you can parse it however you want. Um, so, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Um, I, I hope the talk was acceptable. Um, I hope you've gotten something out of it. I was expecting to take about five more minutes. Uh, it wasn't going to take the full hour regards, but it was a little bit quicker than I thought it. Um, some things I do want to point out. Uh, something I learned recently, Rapture XML has a bug in it that I should probably tell you guys about. It doesn't correctly detect if XML is invalid. So it'll try and parse it anyway and then occasionally break. So I found a really great trick for this. Because NSXML parser is so fast and so low memory, I do a quick parse through with that, and then if that finds an error, I don't pass it through to Rapture XML. 
Uh, otherwise, I, I, uh, I just pass it, pass it straight through. Um, it's a horrible, dirty fix, a hack for a horrible, dirty bug. And is, is, is that because uh, Rapture's trying to be tolerant of bad XML? I'm not entirely sure. It's got unit tests, which he shipped with, at least the version when I was using it, uh, was shipped with unit tests. When I ran them, it failed at his own unit tests. So I think the guy who made it just honestly made a mistake, and uh, I'm assuming it'll be updated sometime soon. It, it, it has a parse um, property, which is a boolean of uh, true or false, uh, yes or no, as to whether it was valid. Uh, sorry, it is valid, um, and that's always true. No matter what you do. No, like, it, it will fail, but there's no exception handling, so it just crashes. Yes, yeah. So, like, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> fail gracefully, it fails a lot. That said, even though it's horrible, I, I still prefer it, um, simply it's because of how easy it is, yeah. Uh, it's ha really not that hard to go, you know, if NSXML parser with file, blah, returns yes, do this, otherwise no. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the talk. Uh, I hope there was something good in there for you. Uh, if not, you can feel free to throw things at me. It's okay, I don't mind. If you have any questions, shout out. Um, that's a stretch question or a question? question. Yep. I okay. Yes. Um, oh, how do you use uh, the right method? Oh. Well, yes. Yeah. No, no. Socket create, etc. Um, if if hang on, I'll just. Where is it? Uh, no. Um, that one there, um, okay, so I looked into this. NS inputs, the NS stream is essentially a really, it's a cocoa-ified wrapper around CF stream. Um, so to initialize it. You need to initialize it as a CF stream first, and then you can convert it into um, an NS stream. NS stream is much nicer to handle than, Coco, uh, than CF stream, because I tried that first, and they ended up crying and like yeah, dr okay. drinking, I don't know, absinthe or something. <laughs> Yes, you can, yeah. Um, but I didn't really go into that because most of the time you don't need to. AF networking, you can just build up an entire packet yourself and send that across if you want. Um, and you don't have to use the pre-built get, push, and put methods either. They're just the easiest way of actually um, creating because they deal with most of the things you're going to be doing. There, there is a more general um, AF networking manager, I think is what it's called from memory, that is, lets you create arbitrary things and send it as opposed to using pre-built ones. But most of the time you're generally doing something that's going to be a get, a push, or a, pull, a put. So um, it, they've got predefined uh, um, methods for those. AF networking is really good though. If you haven't used it, look at it because it's, it's amazing. It's like... I'm kind of glad Goala died because it spun off AF networking. So. Yeah. Does he? Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Any other questions or pelting things at me? No? All right, cool. Uh, so thanks for coming. <laughs>